Happy Wine Wednesday, everybody. You guys just caught me trying to do a last minute touch up. <laughs> uh, anyhow, I hope that your tanks and your week have been fabulous. If you're a seahorse person, I hope they're swimmingly satisfying. <laughs> I don't have any good witty comments, sorry. But um, happy Wine Wednesday. I'm sipping on some Chardonnay. It's become my go-to. I used to be a red, red Pinot Noir girl, and I've just switched over to Chardonnay. Let me know in the comments what you're drinking on tonight. And uh, hey, Aquachar. Brian, oh, yeah, I got to get back with you because I just recalled that I did see your text. I will text you back right after this. I'm sorry. Um, so today, if you're on Instagram, don't forget, it's going to look funny because of the layout. You can always listen to us on Instagram, but if you want to see the video, just hop on over to YouTube, search Seahorse Whisperer, and there we are, right smack dab right there live, and you can join us and comment and pay, pay, a, play a part in the discussion. So today I have with me Holly, Cheryl, and Ray, as per usual. No guests tonight. We're just, we've been open chatting it quite a bit lately. Um, hey, Seahorse Corner. Uh, we need an update on the sea shed, by the way, Seahorse Corner. Um, but yeah, we're going to, we're going to have some guests coming back in. It's just been stressful around here. So open chat is always fun anyways, but let's start with Miss Holly. How you doing? What's going on with the seahorses? I'm doing good. So it's been now about three weeks, I think, since I switched over everything in the display tank to artificial, got rid of the live rock, and it's going great. So there's now starting to be like the thin film type of algae in the tank, which mm -hmm. is way better than the green hair algae I was sure. getting on the rocks. So today was the first day I actually had to clean algae off the tank. And it was as simple as using a magic eraser and just wiping the surfaces. And I have, if you recall, I have half of the tank is sand, half of the mm -hmm. tank is bare bottom. So on the half that was bare bottom, I just moved the decorations from one side to the other and cleaned underneath where they were sitting. <laughs> everything was fine it was nice and easy i didn't pull any decorations out they're not bad enough to go to bleach yet you know so i haven't done that but that gives me time because i figured out because that tank has a hood on it for me to pull the decorations out i would have to remove the whole hood <laughs> which is made out of wood it's really heavy and i keep all my stuff on top of it Mm, and so I'm thinking I, I might want to change the lighting or something and leave the tank open on top instead of with a hood. Mm -hmm. So my husband said that he will do a project for me and make ends on each side of the tank so that my lights can bracket onto that instead of the hood they're bracketed on mm -hmm. now. And then that way... For cleaning, I won't have a hood on it. I'll just have to pull the lights off the top, and that'll make it a lot easier. So, so two, two, wait, that's two, in the work. Hang on, I know you have more, but two responses real quick. We're trying. I'm gonna try not to interrupt. Sorry, but um, first off, um, I want a little bit of discussion when this is over about the hood thing because I remember when I first started, I was always told, "Don't do a hood. It messes up circulation and oxygen and blah blah." But Holly's had no problems with it, so I just want to have a discussion about that. Mm -hmm. Second of all, I'm sure that Brian would say or R Robert would say, "Just add a char chamber." <laughs> and speaking of which, guys, my only update: we're going to go back to Holly, but my only update is still no fry. I'm still waiting on fry, so this one's still sitting here, but it's going to be put to good use. And I'll update you about my char chamber here in a little bit. Sorry, Holly, but go ahead. And, and any thoughts on the hood thing? Yeah. The, the problem with the hood is it holds in the heat and heat mm -hmm. is not your friend with seahorses. And it's something, this is why I use LEDs yeah. and depending on the system, they're basically mounted at least 12 to 15 inches above the tank. And mm -hmm. it still gives me more than enough light. But it gives me also gives me plenty of room to run fans and, and cooling systems for each system, each tank. 
and my lights, I should say too, they they have no temperature. They're LEDs. Right. They're not hot yes. at all. I, I only run LEDs. Well, and and the bottom line is, Holly, you haven't had any trouble with it. You've had success with hooded tanks. No, Ray, it's always this, been hooded. Right. Before we go back to Holly for for her to continue, Ray, any thoughts? Did you ever have an opinion about a hood on a tank? Whether it, I I, I seem to remember like there's not. something about oxygen exchange or something, but mm -hmm. yeah. Less oxygen exchange, but if uh, your levels are okay and you don't actually need any more oxygen, oxygen ex excuse me, exchange, then uh, you don't have to worry about it. But sure. uh, I've never ever covered a seahorse tank, uh, so that's close to twenty years now, and uh, I use uh, ambient lighting for the most part, uh, but uh it can be let's see well the barbs i i made an led fixture that covered part of the top just a light that stretched uh, from one end to the other i took apart a corn cob bulb and uh, made it into a instead of a circular corn cob light i made it into a linear light to sit over top of the uh, barbs tank but uh, the abs tank it still has a compact light sitting in a clamp on fixture uh, hanging about, I don't know, maybe two feet above the tank and uh, don't have any problem with that. So like the, the seahorses don't need it. You might have something in your tank that needs the light, but the, the seahorses don't need anything other than ambient room lighting. Right. But if you have macros or something, yeah. it's a different story. And I seem to remember too, I think it was Dan, it might not have been, but someone told me also that um, the worry, of, and I apologize, significant others working third shift, he's getting ready. So when you hear the shower, I apologize. Um, but anyhow, um, I should have used my AirPods. They were good. Anyhow, I was going to say, I think it was Dan or someone said, also, if you've got that skimmer doing the oxygen, you know, helping with the oxygen, that, that kind of helps too, you know, I mean, how does that help problem? Skimmer. And then another thing is the hood that I have, it's not a normal aquarium hood. I think somebody made it. It's not totally enclosed. The back is completely open. Mm -hmm. It's actually the thing about that aquarium. I inherited it from a friend that passed away. It's acrylic. And the way that it's made, the top is not completely open anyway. Gotcha. It's got these squares, one on each side where you can reach in and do stuff. So it's not an open top right no I, I know i've seen your, your top years now so they must be getting enough oxygen from the sump and the skimmer and all the spaces because it's not i mean it's not watertight covered on top there's air coming in but right. but it's well i i would just say it, like maybe in a smaller tank where you don't have a sump maybe go don't don't have yeah, a top of it. Yeah. And, uh, and my other tank is completely open. The grow right. out tank isn't covered by anything. And they run the exact same pH. Yep. Yep. So, so see you're I, fine. Well and, and I love I love Heather's idea. Heather said she has half the tank. I'm sorry, Seahorse Corner said I have half the glass <laughs> on the back side of the tank just to help with the salt creep from returns. But the front mm -hmm. half of the tank is always open for me. I love that because mm -hmm. Salt mm -hmm. creep is a, <laughs> I hate mm -hmm. salt creep, but anyhow, um, so good, good thoughts. Anything else, Holly? I'm sorry. I know yeah, we are so all, really quick. I wanted to say, sorry, Holly, I just interrupted you again. We are going to show, stick around. We're going to have a discussion about how seahorses change color and how they look different colors and different lighting. And they may not even be changing color. It's just your lighting with some beautiful videos from Holly very shortly, but Go ahead, Holly. Sorry. What else? So anyway, so today was the water change day for everybody. Yeah. And they are always excited about it. And, you know, they start courting on water change day. They get excited. So anyway, today, Sadie decided she's ready to be courting with Scrappy-Doo. Woo! And, of course, Candy is normally who he's courting with. Well, she decided she was ready today too. 
So, <laughs> he's soap opera. Nuts. See, it's like a soap opera. So he's going back and forth trying to share his pouch with everyone. Sadie and Candy are dancing together too. Sadie is just learning to dance. So she's just starting to figure it out. It, it, it's funny. Like, like he'll try to dance with her. You know, she'll give him the nod. They start mm -hmm. to dance and then she swims away and he's chasing her with his pouch. Oh, <laughs> and then she lands on something, you know, hooks her tail around a coral. And then she's trying to line, she's trying to make it easy without having to dance. She's trying to line up with him from hanging on to the coral instead of dancing. Mm -hmm. Well, Cheryl's had yes. Cheryl had seahorses. Well, they were combs, but her seahorses mm -hmm. would do the egg exchange hitched. They they don't dance. Um, and mm -hmm. you guys remind me. Just speaking of the pouch chasing and the fry stuff. After we get through talking to everybody else, somebody remind me um, to tell you the two issues that I'm having with my female right now that's scaring me. But, anyways, um, Holly, real what quick, else? If we can yes. interject. Yes. Well, one of my favorite ones was the young male combs that I raised. He started courting a female, and she was showing more and more interest in him. And they were kind of sort of halfway dancing. Well, he finally got frustrated, wrapped his tail around her, started dragging her in circles. <laughs> <laughs> it, gets, it gets better. It gets better. <laughs> he finally got mad and swam up and hitched to the top of his head. Oh, I no. still to this day don't know whether she was telling him to keep his head out of his pouch or to use his brain. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Hey, uh, real quick, we're going to go back to Holly, but Cheryl, the picture behind you, I don't think I asked last week, um, those are yours, right? Those are fry that you raised. And what, what's the species? Wait a minute. I'm having trouble understanding you. The picture behind you of the fry, all the fry. Oh, those are engines. Engines and you raised them, those correct? Are, those are newborn engines in a nursery tub. Awesome. One brood. Jeez, how many were there? Uh, over a thousand. Like, That's see where I, you get a thousand. It was during this time frame. I, I came to the realization that as a hobbyist breeder, I could not keep up with even a single pair of engines. Right. And they just produce too many fry. You think redye are small? Engines are even much smaller. And they're the ones that get the biggest, right? They're, yeah, yeah. the only thing that gets bigger technically are the, the big Aussie species. Mm. Well, that's crazy. Okay, I, I didn't mean to jump away from you, Holly. I'm sorry. Was there What else? No, that that's pretty much it, I oh. think. And then okay. I sent you the videos. You said you were going to show them shortly. So what that yep. is, is the lighting on this tank, it, it came with it. It had belonged to my friend. And it's one of those fancy um, current systems that's programmable. Yeah. So it's actually supposed to be like reef lighting, but I don't have a reef, but that's my light because I have it, so I use it. So... I discovered on it, most of it, the default is kind of like a blue tinted light, Dactinix mm -hmm. or whatever they call yep. it. And if I switch from that regular program into like a storm, like it has programs for storms oh, right. or cloudy mm -hmm. days or whatever. So there's one for a cloudy day where it's got periods of time where the lighting switches over to like a more yellowish tone. It'll go from blue to white to yellow and just rotate through. So I was noticing when I play that, that the seahorse's colors change accordingly, depending on the lighting as it's going through its thing. So that's what I was sharing. Yeah, no, absolutely. When I'm I, I, in one of my videos, I'll try to find it afterwards, guys, but I show literally this seahorse who started off as a very black colored four week old or whatever 
And then when I moved them to what I had for that at that point is the grow out tank and had, and that tank had macro in it. So it had like freshwater plant lighting, I think mm -hmm. she was yellow and yeah, the, the, yeah. overnight. And I've also done videos too, showing how like when the light comes on, they will be mm -hmm. dark. The seahorses will be darker and blending into whatever. And then mm -hmm. as the light comes on, they get lighter. It's pretty interesting. We will we'll look at those videos in a minute. I promise. But I do want to get some from uh, Ray and Cheryl because I think they both have to leave pretty early tonight. So, Ray, anything new well, with you? Oh, go ahead, oh, Cheryl. Yeah, go ahead, Cheryl. Go ahead, Cheryl. What were you going to say? Well, I was going to say, typically, uh, my seahorses, when they're little, they do a lot of color changes and a lot of experiments. Mm -hmm. Typically, sure. And they cycle into breeding condition. I rarely see color changes. It doesn't matter what the lights do, because they, they have set their pattern and they're basically soliciting or dancing, and they're doing it at basically at the color they're at. And yeah, but yeah, Cheryl, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was gonna say, like with my combs. The females will typically go white with dark markings. The males will come in with more yellow or orange markings with darker stripes. And they don't change color. And uh, one of the interesting things, though, is that that's combs. Uh, engines, on the other hand, they tend to turn more of a golden kind of color. And then they the male will darken when pregnant and will hide more. Obviously, that's very normal. With erectus, they're all tear off the Richter scale. They're right. all, that's all over the place. No, thank you for making that point that it definitely depends on the species. And I was thinking as you were saying that, um, in your case, once your seahorses are adults, you don't usually move them to different lighting, do you? I mean, they stay in the tank. They're I in, don't right? mess with lighting. Yeah. So see that, that what well, Holly and I were discussing last week. Actually, we, you're right. You're right. Uh, lighting does make algae, but it can also make them pretty because that's what Holly and I are going to show here in a little bit is that, you know, they can be different colors just based on the lighting you have. In fact, I, I hate taking videos of the 40 gallon on one because mm -hmm. the light I have has so much blue in it. And you guys mm -hmm. have helped me adjust that, but I still have to turn the blue off just to take videos because yeah. it, it's not cute. Ray, um, let's go to you. How, what's going on with you? Anything new? No, nothing really new, but I just wanted a few comments to make. Mm -hmm. um, there was, I forget who said it now. Somebody was talking about LEDs not being hot. I've had some pretty good burns from LEDs, so I dispute that hot bit. Yeah, well, I'm lucky then because I feel mine. They don't get hot to the touch, so. Well, many do. And uh, uh, if you put a thermometer right near an LED light on top of an aquarium, compare mm -hmm. that to uh, the actual ambient temperature, you'll find a difference in uh, temperature too. Yeah. But then the other thing I wanted to comment on was when you were talking about skimmers and uh, depending on that for proper oxygenation, uh, a long time ago, I had to do some experimenting to prove to uh, some people that skimmers do not oxygenate a tank like an open-ended airline can mm -hmm. um, and the main reason for it basically is if a skimmer is properly dialed in it's removing uh, the dissolved organics from the water and the way it does it it the uh, the bubbles get coated and once they get coated with uh, the organics they are no longer uh, given any exchange of oxygen. Right. And a simple way to prove it is if you have a, a skimmer, turn it off uh, for a few days and check the uh, uh, the pH of the tank. Mm -hmm. Turn it back on and uh, check the pH of the tank again and see if there's a difference. And usually with a skimmer, turning it back on, you're not going to see much. But then if you take a sample of uh, your water and put it outside uh, where it has access to fresh air and 
put an open-ended airline in it, and uh, it only takes about a couple hours, and you'll see a difference in the pH then. Ray, are you talking about um, running an open-ended airline from outside to the skimmer? Is that what you're saying? No. To I'm just saying that uh, a lot of people figure because the skimmer, they've got a skimmer hooked on their tank, and they've got all these bubbles. They feel that it's uh, giving the oxygen, oxygen exchange there. But if no. it's properly dialed in, it can't give a proper exchange because the bubbles get coated with the organics. Mm -hmm. They come up. Uh, and then that the makes bubbles sense. go up and escape. And, uh, okay, well, it, for, really quick, Katie, I see your question. We're going to go to that next. But, Ray, my question um, about what you're saying is I agree, first of all, uh, skimmer can't be depended on for your oxygen exchange, for sure. I agree. But my two questions are, and, and, and in saying that, excuse me, uh, surface agitation, would, would you say that's the most important is my first question. And then my yeah. second question is how come in my reef, because, of, you know, we've got, I've got a smoker in this house. We, our windows don't open. So it's really poor um, airflow in my house period. And when I had my reef, I was having a lot of trouble keeping the pH up and just with oxygen exchange. And so Cruz Arias, my uh, reef mentor had me run and um, from the skimmer to the outside, and that made a world right. of difference, along with reverse light cycle. But, um, yeah. Ray, what do you think about those two things? Well, first of all, I, I believe if you have uh, a tight, uh, fresh air situation, and if you're having problems with pH, then any way that you can get fresh air to the top surface of the tank is yeah. going to be a bonus. Okay. Um, and would you yeah, say that, that surface I, agitation is the most, I'm sorry, would you say that surface yeah, agitation? I believe surface agitation is more important than uh, the bubbles in the skimmer. Although mm -hmm. I feel that uh, skimmers are def most definitely a recommended uh, tool to have in the seahorse keeping hobby. But they, they are not going to oxygenate a tank. Right. Got it. I understand. Now I have one other comment I just want sure. to make. You're talking about uh, the uh, lighting. And uh, Holly was mentioning that I think the go-to lighting was uh, blue. And I'd just like anybody that's listening, if they're ever going to post pictures wanting a diagnosis of problems, right. please use daylight lighting, not blue yeah. lighting. Yeah, that's what I was just saying is that I was just saying that I can't, I, I have to turn the blue off completely mm -hmm. to take videos because they don't, you can, they, you don't even, in a video, you, it picks up too much of the blue. And even if I look at my tank and I can see their beautiful colors and whatever on the video, it's just blue. And I agree, right? I hate those posts yeah. where they're like, what's this? And you're like, yeah. you can't even well, see. it's the sky or <laughs> it's water. Well, that's why I like to switch the lighting if I'm going to take pictures because mm -hmm. yeah, they don't take good pictures in, in the blue light. <laughs> Absolutely. So real quick, guys, let's let's tackle Katie's question. And I am coming back. I'm just uh, trying to get the significant other out of the house. That's why you see a black screen. I'll be back in just a second. Um, but Katie says, how do I feed seahorse fry? If my seahorses have babies, how do I care for them? And she's just in the learning phase. But that's a really big question. But let's try to tackle it. Um, first, first, my first suggestion, Katie, would be go join Seahorse Sources Group <laughs> because you'll get help every step of the way. And there are some good articles in the file section. But what are just some basics that um, we would advice we would give for Fry? I'll go last. Cheryl, how about you start? Okay. First of all, I have I use round circular tubs. And the reason that I use those rather than square tanks is because the fry can orient into the flow and selectively food as it passes by, rather than trying to swim all over the place and figure out where the brine shrimp or copepods or whatever are at. Secondly, it's self-cleaning in that because it's a circular flow, the tritus that gets flushed out into the filter sock, into the sump, and it's easy to clean. That makes a huge difference in terms of taking care of the fry. The other aspect is you have to watch and pay attention. What species are you dealing with? How large are the fry? Because there's a big difference between uh, hippocampus engines, who is basically smaller than an eyelash, or hippocampus uh, erectus, which basically hitch at birth or 
run about uh, close to half an inch or more at birth. So you're looking you're looking at uh, what species you're raising. The other aspect is protozoan type parasites in the form in several different forms. And one of the things that we I don't do it anymore because I don't have the problems that I used to when I first started. But very many people have a lot of problems with ciliates and killing their fry. And the thing that you can do is you can treat them on days one on birth with a formalin, 37% formalin, which will kill off the ciliates. The problem with that is it's also going to, it doesn't mess you with your filtration. It's good to go. I know a lot of people that still use it. I rarely use it anymore, but I've got massive filtration systems on my nurseries. And the other aspect of it is when you feed them. When you convert them, start training for uh, mice, and mice and shrimp. How good is the mice and shrimp truly in relationship to their growth? Uh, mice and shrimp is a either a brackish water or a freshwater species. It lacks the HUFAs necessary for most saltwater fish. So you're actually better off if you can do it feeding them copepods, saltwater copepods, because they lack, they have the uh, highly unsaturated fatty acids. Wait, 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 wait. Acid, Cheryl, hey, 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 I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but this is why I, I, I when we have a, question that's this big, I, I feel like, oh my gosh, these people are going to get overwhelmed. <laughs> You'll have simpler answers from <laughs> Cheryl's a scientist. Okay. But Cheryl, well, I, I tend to take up on tangents. It's okay. No, no, no. I wasn't saying that at all. You're, we value your opinions and your expertise for absolute sure. I just wouldn't, Katie, I wouldn't want you to get scared off because my Very answers thorough. would be a lot simpler. Um, yeah. But Cheryl, just, yeah, I, just I, I, I tend to, I tend just to go make, to the top. No, it's fine. No, we would be lost without you. In fact, we need to get Francis back here to give us something on his resources because you saved his resources. But Cheryl, just to just to make clear, when you say a better food is copepods, you mean a, copepods might be better than hatching artemia or than mycids for adults? I, that kind of confused me. No, because there's no way you can feed for adults. neonatal. Okay, copepods for neonatal fit fry are a superior food source to brine shrimp. Gotcha. Brine shrimp lack the uh, HUFA and, and lipids. Yeah. And I would yeah. just say, Katie, too, um, uh, I will, we're, we have this uh, special guest, Dan, from Seahorse Source, and he's done, I'll try to link it when we're done, but he already did a, uh, you know, how to keep seahorses, ask Seahorse Source Part 1. Then we covered... What did we cover in the second one? I think medications in the third one that's still yet to come. So subscribe to the channel and come back every week. Um, Dan's going to come back and discuss things like hatching artemia, enriching artemia, keeping fry, best methods, probiotics, all that stuff is still coming. Uh, no problem with asking the question now, but I'm just saying, hope you come to that episode. And with that, I wanted to last thing show before we move on to Ray and then Holly Wanted to show you guys um, this, and I will link it when we're done. But, oh, it's not big screen. That's all right. So this is um, something you are wanting to set up this, this circular is something tubs. that uh, small Cheryl might make. These are her tubs, and she goes into ice, detail about how she creates them, what's required, the all that top. stuff. So if you want to get... Wait, wait, and hang on. You're going to hear Holly and I talk about um, raising fry and so simpler manner. And but if the you want to go all out, then there's a video to show you right what's side up. Is okay, go ahead, Cheryl. Sleeve that, that's over the standpipe. And if you notice, go there's ahead, a Cheryl. cover at the bottom of that sleeve. And I cut out okay. holes in it for uh, the filtration. Yes. And ultimately, Kelly? that gets yes, covered then with either 650 six, six, micron mesh six, or six. window screen. Can you not hear um, me, Cheryl? Okay. Th th those were all my pictures of tubs and nurseries that I've built. I, I just and, said that. Yes, yeah, the, the 670 works well for most 
window screen will not work until they're a little bit bigger, first of all. Uh, it's one of those things where, but what, what I'm most concerned with is the nutrition value. I have a scientific paper that I saw on my computer. I'd have to pull it up. They literally tested differences in feeding newborn erectus, and they had several different groups. One was feeding them copepods. One was feeding them just brine shrimp. One was feeding them enriched brine shrimp. And then they carried it over several weeks and monitored the survivorship. And there was a huge difference depending on what they were fed early on and what they were continually being fed as they matured. Sure. And I, well, I know. Yeah. Sorry. A lot that's of people say, why do I lose them at two weeks? Well, the reason you're losing them at two weeks is because they lack the nutritional profile and the food you're feeding them to sustain them long term. Okay, so real quick, first of all, can you guys not hear me when I'm screen sharing? Could you not hear me? I, I could hear you oh. and the video at the oh. same time. I'm so yeah. sorry, guys. It does. I can't. Oh, I've got it muted on my end. So I'm sorry. You. I was talking over myself. <laughs> Great. But I was just saying I did give Cheryl credit. That is Cheryl's tubs. That's a video that I did with Cheryl. And I just linked it um, in the description. Sorry, Katie. I didn't realize yeah. that was happening. But anyhow, um, that was just showing you the tubs. Totally agree with what you're saying, Cheryl. And that's why when we get into the deeper, more in-depth conversation, um, that's why, you know, Dan's going to explain why brine shrimp by itself, even freshly hatched, even N star one or whatever it is, it doesn't, it's not good enough. You have to enrich brine shrimp. And I agree with Cheryl that copepods or plankton are better method um, for fry. Mm -hmm. But when you're in a situation like me, I live in Indiana. I can't buy enough or keep enough or get enough copepods mm -hmm. and I can't go out and collect. And yeah. so it just becomes um, difficult. So I will just say, while Cheryl's absolutely right, she is at, she is never wrong, I promise. Um, but it, it, you can do it without going to those lengths because I've raised dry as a hobbyist with just enriched brine shrimp. So, but I'll, I'll leave my tail for the end. Go ahead, Cheryl, finish up. I was going to say the biggest thing is, if you really want to raise seahorses in large numbers, you need to know the species. You need to know the size, the typical size of the fry. And ideally, what you really want to do is grow out large cultures of copepods that will fit into their snouts when they're first born. That, that is a very critical period, and that's where most people lose within the first one to two weeks where they lose most of their fry. See, and, and I would disagree because, and I, well, I shouldn't say I would disagree. I never disagree with Cheryl ever, <laughs> but um, I would just say that in my case, I had zero, I, I didn't have many losses until it got to weaning. Weaning was my biggest problem because I hey, they didn't want to take the frozen foods and I wasn't good at tough love. But Ray, what are your thoughts? Her, her main question was, you know, if I buy seahorses and they have babies and Cheryl made some good points about how nutrition first off is most important, but what are your thoughts on feeding seahorse fry and et cetera? Well, in my opinion, it's too big a topic to handle in this uh, time period sure. we have on mm -hmm. here. Yeah. I posted on uh, YouTube the link to Dan's uh, files on okay. uh, Facebook, but I don't know if that comes up for her to see when she's on the Facebook page, not on YouTube, you know, the file. Yeah, I do know the file. If you uh, pasted a link to the file section, she has to be a member. So if you're a member here, you know what? I can show you right now how to get there. It's so simple. Um, hang on one second. Hang on. When she's learning, I don't think there's a better page for her to start with. I agree. Than, uh, that files. I agree. And here, let me, I'm going to show her how to get there in case um your yours didn't work so here we go really fast and then we're going to go back to ray because i know he has to go in a second okay so if you are on facebook and you search up seahorse sources group so just in the search seahorse sources group you go there yes, yeah. and then we don't show tie-in messages sorry <laughs> sorry tie-in and then you it doesn't show right off the bat but if you go to more and you go to files 
then you've got just this wealth of information. Seahorse Fry Nursery. Yes. Automated Dwarf System. Wine Wednesday. Look at that. I, I think I need to update that. I haven't done it in a while. Um, but there's just pretty much, I mean, Tank Mate Guy. There's, there's all kinds of articles in there. And, and I, I, I don't see, I hope someday we can pull up the um, old files from Tammy Wise that were about the lipids and mice shrimp and stuff because you're making good points, Cheryl. I just, uh, you know, don't want to scare people off. But that's how you get there. And Ray would all, uh, but uh, and Ray posted a link. If you have any trouble, you can always contact any of us, and we'll help you get there. But can I agree. I Let's do on, a topic. Uh, but go ahead. Can I comment on Tammy's site, Cheryl? Uh, you have uh, ways to change things on Seahorse Sources page? Yes. Um, you can, um, can you change the link for Tammy's site to the, um, oh, what do you call it? The archived? Yeah, the archived one, if I give you the link. Uh, yeah. Please send it to, send me the link. Yeah, or or I'm an admin too, and I've tried doing that. So yeah, yeah let's I, I can I can change that stuff because yeah. to me it, it was a great source of information. Oh my gosh. Not, yeah. It works slow on this archive site, and there are a few pages that don't work. But for what is there, I think is invaluable. Absolutely, I'm looking up something else to show before we go to Holly. So Ray, what other? I know it's too big of a discussion to have in one sitting, but just. Any any basics about feeding fry and and her next question was oh I'm sorry I'm jumping around too much her next question was um, if you if your seahorse has babies and you don't have the means of keeping them what then so is it too big you know big of a task for a hobbyist what do you think Ray while I look this up it's too big uh, for someone just starting out unless uh, they've done a lot of research and realize what they're getting into. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first thing uh, that I suggest to people for many years before they get into that or before they get into keeping dwarfs, start hatching, enriching uh, Artemia cysts to see what is involved and then realize how often you're going to have to do it. And is this going to be a task that you really want to take on? Yeah. Well, and if you're that the feeding is so important and it's such a big part of the time that's involved that uh, it's what normally kills people off from the hobby in trying to keep them or like seahorse uh, dwarf keepers. Uh, most of them get out of it uh, because of the work involved in that live food. Absolutely. But the, the real answer to the second question is. Um, well, I'll wait for my turn. I'm sorry. Cheryl, finish up because I want to go to Holly because I think she's going to oh, have some different answers. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was just going to say it depends so much on the species too. Right. Uh, engines produce extremely small fry. Redi are slightly larger. Erectus are huge. Combs are definitely smaller than erectus, closer to redi size. And one of the problems that occurs is finding adequate food, a su sufficient food to feed all those mouths. I mean, it's one thing to raise baby brine shrimp and enrich them. It's entirely something else where you're working with species that require some much smaller foods, yeah. copepods. I'm not a big fan of rotifers and I'm for several reasons, but it's one of those things where you have to match your food source to your species. And I think this is something a lot of people don't really quite fully comprehend. Yeah. Uh, this is why erectus are easy to raise because they typically produce larger uh, pelagic fry or uh, benthic fry yeah. at birth. Sure. No, I agree 100%. I don't know where you're located, Katie, but like in my case, it would be really difficult for me to find engines yeah. or, you know, the species that she's talking about. So while she's absolutely correct, if you're talking about erectus, it's, I would say it's a, she's right, but it's a tad different. Holly, what are, what are your thoughts? on? Her well, questions? I think the first thing is you have to realize that oh, raising. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt you. I swear I wouldn't, but she's in Florida. Okay. She's yeah. she do this. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. So raising fry, 
is very labor intensive. And I was able to do it a couple years ago because COVID came along and I had a lot of time. So my first suggestion is before you start raising fry, study how it is that it's done. Like everyone's talking about, you know, read the files, um, watch videos and things that people were posting of actually doing it and decide if you have the time to handle that labor and in, invest the money into them because it can get expensive too, I found. Um, you're treating them with um, formalin occasionally, like people mentioned for parasites and things, ciliates mainly. Uh, you've got to clean the brine shrimp before you feed them. You have, I was hatching brine shrimp twice a day and I didn't have that many fry. My seahorses did not have hundreds of fry. They had, I got lucky in that it was maybe 60 or so at a time. I had one big batch of 150, but other than that, they were small batches. And by the time they were growing up, I was barely keeping up in, with them in brine shrimp hatching and then converting them into frozen food. So you, it's, it's something you want to plan ahead for, really. And if you are figure out that you're not up to it, maybe you don't have the time to invest in them, I would just get some same-sex seahorses because they're great. I would suggest females. They seem to be you know, more active, in my opinion, and more fun to watch. But there's nothing wrong with that. But I okay, like this, this miss seeing them, but I will tell you, I do not miss all the hard work in taking care of them. All right, my turn, my turn, my <laughs> turn. Okay, so first no. off, first off <laughs> number one, Katie, you're in Florida. We've been looking for someone interested in seahorses in Florida. <clears throat> if you excuse me, if you ever get seriously interested, seahorse source is retired and we need someone to go reopen okay but uh beside all that if you're just a hobbyist trying to look into let's do seahorses i would absolutely be fine with putting you in contact with dan because he would help you with every step of the way um instead of these vague you know over all quite as ray said it's too much to discuss just you know mm -hmm. there's so many aspects of it and then when we start ran you know not rambling but talking about it on and on like oh my gosh no way i couldn't do it so here's my thoughts my two cents number one if i can do it anybody can do it that's number one number two they're all right feeding so important and you know that's why i didn't have many fry live at first just because i didn't know about enrichment i didn't know about coca pods and all this other stuff but bottom line is you know as i learned i started keeping more fry um number three just to kind of silly uh I don't know if people might take this terrible. Please don't take this terrible. Hey, Chen, by the way. But the reason that seahorses have so many fry is because few are expected to live, especially in the ocean. I know that sounds mean. I'm not trying to be mean, but I'm just saying it, we're probably keeping more alive than when we live in the ocean. Okay. So it's, I don't know. That's just, I'm going to leave it there. Also, um, as Cheryl said, and, and I showed you the video, she talks about tubs. I did end up doing tubs because it is a better method. But Holly and Heather, Seahorse Corner, who's got so many fries she can't even keep up with, have done it in square tanks. You know, it's just more labor intensive, as Holly said. You got to, Cheryl can get away with not doing as much or, you know, whatever, because she's got large water volumes. So if you're looking at commercial scale, that's kind of a different conversation than if you're just a hobbyist, your seahorse has fry, seahorses have fry, and you're like, oh, cool, I want to raise them. It's doable. You're not going to have some massive success and start a business doing it that way. But if you're just looking to do it, I love fry. I'm desperate for my seahorse to give birth because I miss them. I used to have fry around all the time. Holly's not wrong. Labor intensive. Yeah. But now I'm like, I miss them. And I want to I want to experiment with them. I want to try the copepod thing and this, that, and the other. That also with copepods, I, I think I said it before, but it's just very difficult to get or keep enough of them because yeah, Ray said also four liter jars can work. I know you have to leave Ray. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. um, but th there's just so many multiple ways to be successful, depending on what you, you know, if you want to, like I said, do it commercially and start a business, 
that's going to be different. Then we move into, you got to have large, you know, all this other stuff. But many of us have raised fry successfully in our homes, you know, 10 gallon tank and then right. moved to like a 30 gallon when they got bigger. When I first started, just cause Ray, you have to go. Let, let, let me interject. Let me interject something. Okay. Wait, wait. Okay. Dan has been my mentor for over 17 years, first of all. Uh-huh. And one of the biggest problems most people have when trying to keep or raise newborn seahorses is too small of a water volume. The water volume cannot be maintained appropriately. You get into the problems with the ciliates, etc. My nursery systems, each one of my nursery systems is over 70 gallons. And right. I'm a hobby. I know, but you're high-end hobbyist. Let's just put <laughs> things that we can't even get. And we have Chris Carey from Seahorse Australia here. Chris, I've been chomping at the Who bit. Is I've been to... Wait, wait, wait. I've been trying Do to be something polite. on your face. Okay, Cheryl, hang on. I've been trying to be polite and not interrupt this whole time, so now I'm getting out all my comments. And then we're going to go to Chris because we're so happy he can never come anymore. But as I said, you can do it as a hobbyist. There's, I don't personally think there's anything wrong with if you can't raise them that they're, you know, that you just don't. I, I, I just think that, you know, that stuff happens. It's like if you're a confit shed fry and you didn't want, you know, you know it sounds bad. I think I just, you. Uh, okay. Hang on, Cheryl, please. Hang so on. I'm not putting you your Oz. Okay. Hang on. Hold, hold on. Somebody uh, in Oz. Perfect. Hang on, Cheryl. Hang on. Okay. So, Katie, just to finish up, I was just going to say, you asked, um, do sometimes, and I know Chris is going to want to comment on this, um, do people ever release older fry maybe into habitats where there are seahorses to repopulate? No. No, 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 never, not a, not unless you're a scientist and working, I mean, like, if you're, I don't know, maybe you are, maybe you're working at a college or working at a university, but Chris... Welcome. We're so glad to have you. Can you give your two cents on that question first, and then we'll go from there? Hey, guys. Um, yeah, releasing seahorses back into the wild is a is a terrible idea um, just because uh, you don't know for a fact that the seahorses that you've got actually even come from the area that you're in, um, especially if they're uh, exotic species or uh, just, just found in different areas. But um, it's a terrible idea for two reasons. It's not a good idea for your seahorses because, um, you know, being being raised in, in captive systems, um, they're not trained for the for the wild, basically, and chances are they're probably going to get eaten or or uh, not know how to hunt for food or whatnot um, to, to survive adequately. But it's also a terrible idea for the wild populations if there are wild populations there because... There is a chance that they could bring diseases or problems to those wild populations and uh, and and whatnot. So yeah, it's a terrible idea. Um, don't release your seahorses into the wild. Um, and I'd say the same thing with fish in general. Just don't release any aquarium fish into uh, wild habitats. Yeah, that's kind and of hi guys. Hey Chris, that's kind of why um like this the title. What? Oh my gosh. I see I drink wine on these wine Wednesdays and then I can't find my words, but that's kind of that's like, the fun. <laughs> I know, right. Could Kelly like that. But, um, so that's kind of part of a big part of, you know, why like Australia won't allow any imports and why, um, this title, whatever that's coming up, it could be really scary. Right. Because the, everyone's worried about things like, sorry, um, Calerpa in California or lionfish being released and et cetera. And that's why they're making all these new laws. They're then restricting us as keepers and we can't get things anymore because people tried to do that. But I will say, Katie, that's not a bad question. That's a good question. It shows that you care and you're trying to do the right thing, you know, like release them instead of if you can't care for them, that makes sense. It's just, please don't. <laughs> but any, any other thoughts on that, Chris, and how are you, what's going on with you? Um, I mean, there are, there are certain instances, like there's there's an example of uh, the White's Seahorse. There's a scientific program underway to breed them um, at, a, at a very special holding facility and then release them back into the wild in areas where their populations have been depleted. Absolutely. Um, but that also goes hand in hand with a um, other projects to restore some of their natural habitat where due to 
human activities, it's it's declined over many years. So um, yeah, basically it's tr them trying to sort of rebalance um, the equation where yeah, human activities have had a negative impact on the wild seahorse populations and to uh, try and try and remedy that. Um, you, yeah, so are you, like. Are you talking about the white eyes in Sydney Harbour? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Because that's been going on for many years. And initially, they were having trouble even keeping them in captivity, if I recall correctly. And ultimately, were able to produce some very healthy, large seahorses mm -hmm. to be released. And they monitored them very closely. And I'm still not sure it was a good idea. Uh, time will tell. Well, I would just say Seahorse Australia is the one they're doing the red handfish. And I mean, handfish, you know, they're trying to work on these kind of things, but they're a facility. Yeah, no, I'm, I was I'm just, familiar. I agree with your question, Katie. It's a good question. And Chris can talk much further about this, but I'm just saying as hobbyists, we never want to do this. But if you're working, go ahead, Chris, I'll shut up. Yeah, if you, if you leave it in the hands of, of scientists and whatnot um, with really well sort of uh, sort of thought out things and with, with sort of more organised projects and that, yeah, something that they can sort of try and tackle. Um, and and now I'm Chris formerly of Seahorse World. Right, I know, I know, <laughs> I know. Obviously yeah. not there anymore, but um, yeah, it's good to see you guys. Good to finally pop back in and say hello. I won't be able to stay for super long, but I thought I'd better pop in and say hello while I've got a, a quick chance. I'm loving the, um, the new look. Yeah, <laughs> trying to the grow out the beard a little bit. Yeah. I do have a yep, question, the fuzzy question for you, Chris. I, I think I tagged you. Somebody posted two pics. They looked like Kalagis, but I'm not that good on uh, Oz species and some of those. I, I don't know if you saw it or not. I don't recall. I, yeah, I okay. don't. I don't I'll, I'll recall. Just sorry. Back up, because they had the they, they looked one looked very much like a kalagi. The other, I was kind of shaky on, and they got them in Oz. Okay. Chris isn't there anymore. <laughs> he hasn't gone. Yeah. No. I'm, that I mean, doesn't help much. That doesn't help a lot. still there. I know. But, but yeah, um, Chris, take the, a peek. The biggest difference is they lack, They had a much shorter snout than what you typically find in the Kalagis in Oz. And that okay. one kind of threw me for a loop. I was trying to figure out what in the heck they were. Well, we've talked endlessly. It's really hard to, with identification. I know Project Seahorse and, and others have done identification pamphlets and, and books and stuff with all the spines and everything. But as we've seen with the erectus and redi, as they commingle, we're getting, you know, and, and then you, you look at the cuda complex and how they all come back to, uh, you know, possibly same species kind of thing, just adaptions where they go. It's hard to ID. I know that was a rambling ramble, but it's hard to ID a seahorse, uh, you know, from somewhere else for sure. Well, yeah, definitely not the easiest things to ID. I still want to, oh, I want to know Chris, zebra. Chris. Sorry, go ahead, Cheryl. In go my ahead. dreams. Zebras? Yeah. 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 In we my dreams. Zebra. Ain't going to happen. In my dreams, too. I know, right? We all dream of the zebras. The zebra seahorses. Chris, what is that shirt, though? It looks like my little shrimp, but much cooler. Shrimpy shirt. <laughs> uh, just just one for the collection. It looks like a lobster. No, no, I'm kidding. That's a shrimp. Oh, my shrimp turned up after 11 days missing. He was, he showed up in the filter sock. He'd been in the um, overflow box all that time. I knew it. He's been on an adventure. <laughs> yeah. Chris, are you still, obviously you're still the shrimp dude, but are you, are you still looking at doing something with shrimp? Yeah, possibly. Um, yeah, just things things are a little bit weird at the moment, so I'm just sort of trying to to settle in, and I'm just not sure 100 percent what I'm going to do yet. But um, I'm working it out. Sure. Well, I'll talk to you after. I won't ask you live. Um, but also, just to weigh in on uh, Katie's first question, um, what are your thoughts? And again, guys, this is another person who's worked at a large 
facility. Like it's not a hobbyist. Mm -hmm. I just try to make that distinction because when Cheryl and Chris go into all this stuff, you know, it's like, wait a minute, but you can just do it with some brine shrimp and enrichment. I promise. But um, Chris, what are your thoughts? Because we've been discussing lately, Cheryl's been doing some, re um, <clears throat> not re um, can't think of the word uh, testing or what, however you want to say it with copepods thinking that copepods are much better. Well, they are a much better food for newborn fry than, um, enriched artemia and you discussed the different species need what are your thoughts about someone raising fry what's how what how what uh, la, la, la. what's feeding like <laughs> talk to us yeah um raising fry is a pain in the butt but it's more of a labor of love um <laughs> honestly like it, it's 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 not a fun time but they are they are pretty cool um like yeah, anyone who's who's raising seahorses for any length of time will tell you that it's it's not the easiest thing in the world. Um, it takes a lot of time, yeah. effort, and dedication to uh, see those seahorses through to to sort of more adult stages. Um, sort of regarding like copepods and that, I guess it would just depend on the species of seahorse, how how big or small the fry are, and how big or small the copepods are um and yeah the species of copepod and and sort of what they do and um how how sort of uh creepy they are well, <laughs> some if, of them have yeah, really fly, i would definitely say start with the rectus if it's your first time because i think they're the simplest especially since yeah. you're in florida they shouldn't you know you you should have them readily available you know and and they aren't as tough to raise as the other species I hear that we have available here in the U US anyway. So I would start there, but I definitely look into what's involved before you go there, because I totally agree with Chris. At having done it, I raised a few batches of fry for about a year and they're the cutest little things, but they are the biggest pain in the ass. Oh, come on. They, they are a labor of love. <laughs> they are. Well, when you I have... remember my day, my husband was cursing one of them out. <coughs> he, he was like, you're not even cute anymore. <laughs> <laughs> when you have 15 or 20 tanks, your kitchen counters are covered in tanks. The only rooms in your house that don't have seahorse tanks or your bathrooms and you're telling your kids that you're going to fill up a bathtub and turn that into a seahorse facility yeah you know you're going over the top but wait i, I just want to say one thing it to is Katie. really doable though because like i said i raised a few um and i did it in small tanks i had um a 10 gallon tank that they would start out in you know after they were born and I just call them from there, you know, some would die off and I'd end up with a few survivors out of each batch. I had um, a total of close to 30, I think 25 or so that I raised in all out of a few different batches. And I just kind of upgraded things as I went along and as I learned my very first batch, I was able to raise five to adults and I did it on a shoestring budget. I did it with smaller tanks. I just, it was just, like I said, labor intensive. There was a lot of water changes, you know. Yeah, that, well, that's, that's exactly what I was thinking. Thanks a lot. If you're willing to do the work, you can do it. Yep. That's what I was saying yeah. earlier is that, Cheryl's talking about if you want to set up for commercial or mm -hmm. um, future success forever, where you're really going to get into this, you can do it with large volumes of water and tanks, but you can also literally have two five or 10 gallon tanks and just mm -hmm. swap them out every week. That works too. Yep. So That's what's what really I cool, let me finish. What's really cool about Wine Wednesday and about Seahorse Sources Group, that's my first suggestion, is that you can go in there and ask questions you know, every step of the way. And like I said, I'd be happy to put you in contact with Dan. And I just wanted to note that since you obviously are a caring person about the seahorses in the wild, the more that people like us breed seahorses and make them available to the aquarium industry, the less are taken from the wild. 
right? So mm -hmm. it, it's just really a good thing. It, it is labor intensive. It, if you're into it, you seem like someone who really is interested. You asked for a link. I'll also say mm -hmm. I've been working on a website for over a year. It's still not done. So until that's done, I would suggest going to um, Seahorse Savvy's website. She has a great website and mm -hmm. um, Seahorse Sources group because, and, and I think Seahorse Savvy has a group too, but Chris, yeah. I need to She's Chris, great. She does right? capital spread, and that's one way to support seahorses in the wild is to buy them captive bred instead yes. of buying what we caught. No, absolutely agree. And I, I Holly, we are still going to get to the color changes, but Chris, I have two questions about a female I've got. So when you have to go, I need a five minute warning so I can interrupt everybody and okay. ask my questions. Five minute warning. <laughs> <laughs> the um the other thing I'll say is circle back to the original question about copepods. Yes. Um, two things that you need to take into consideration with that is the nutritional profile of the copepods. Copepods usually have a much better nutritional profile for for seahorses. Basically, we try and use uh, brine shrimp or artemia to basically try and mimic what the uh, nutritional profile of the um of the copepods is, but usually it's a, a pretty poor imitation. Um, even with uh, with enrichment, we basically try and enrich them to make them closer to the uh, nutritional profile of the copepods, but it does actually vary based on the species of copepods and whatnot. So um, mm -hmm. the other other factor that you've got to really factor in is, is basically if you can sustainably get a, um, a good culture of the, the copepods up, or whether you're going to need to keep buying them in or, or collecting them from elsewhere to sustain uh, your uh, copepod population. Because seahorses are very voracious little eaters and they will eat you out of house and home with all your little copepods. So unless you've got a, uh, a good culture going and you're producing a, a lot of them that you can consistently feed out to your seahorses, you'll find that you'll feed them out in no time. Mm -hmm. I, I use uh, Epicyclops panamensis for my fry and the beauty of them because i've worked with a number of different couple couple pod species is they reproduce much more rapidly than many of these species if they're in an optimal environment and that part of it i do like uh i do not like using brine shrimp for source fry it's just over but the you can years, I found you can <laughs> I got to keep button in there saying you can still, you can. Because like me, I couldn't get enough copepods. I couldn't keep enough copepods. There's no way. So I use brine shrimp and enrichment. And we'll discuss that a lot deeper on Ask Seahorse Source Part 3. Hey, Chris, not to veer off topics, but I know you're going to have to go soon. I'm not going to ask my two questions till the five-minute warning. But we were discussing Whitey Eye a minute ago. Okay. What's the difference? Like, wh why is there a difference in opinion? Like, people saying they're... Um, becoming extinct, whereas you're ha you, you did have so much success with them at Seahorse World, like you, they were you were doing so well, and they you had so many. I think it just comes down to the the different setups and um, the sort of knowledge and experience with the the species. Um, I definitely had a lot of trouble with them at the start as well. Um, over over time, um, working with them and sort of trial and error, figuring out uh, what worked and what didn't. I was able to come up with a really good setup that would sort of uh, uh, breed them on, on a decent scale and uh, and uh, raise the young. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just, just even with any species of seahorse, it, it's a lot of trial and error figuring out what works and what doesn't. Um, and whether that's talking about foods, talking about uh, tank sizes, tank yeah. setups, uh, maintenance routines, water changes, um, tank cleaning, like there's so much that goes into it and um, figuring out what works and what doesn't isn't always a, um, you know, like a, a a recipe, like do this, do this, do this, pop it in the yeah. oven and yeah. out comes There's so many different way. ways to be successful. There's so many different ways, but yeah. I, we're, we're just still and forevermore glad for your contribution to seahorses because you did so many cool things oh. we're going to talk about color here in a little bit go ahead cheryl D dan and i both worked with engines and they produce huge numbers of very tiny pelagic fry 
And one of the things that occurred is both Dan and I, we could get him to five to six months of age, and then we'd lose him. They were eating, everything looked good, they looked fine. And it was one of those things, to this day, I still have not cracked that nut. I still, what well, were we missing with that? The, the really unfortunate thing for Chris is because he was working for a facility, he can't share all his secrets with us, which is a bummer. I want all the secrets. <laughs> I want to know, how did you wean? How did you, what did you feed? And and yeah, we we understand that you cannot share that stuff all the time, Chris. So anyways, what else? <laughs> or should I go to my two questions? I should probably make myself visible. Go okay. to your two questions. I'm, I'm interested. Yeah. I'm curious. So first question, my fee and if and, and Katie or anyone else, if you have more questions, we'll go to you guys because you're the important people. But my female um, that it, I think is currently impregnating my male has a odd tail. So, and I, I talked to Cheryl about this when I first got her. The seahorse this tail is fine and then at the very end it's not a it's not a bump on the tail like a, a gbd or whatever it's literally the end of the tail is a ball okay and cheryl discussed it with me and we watched as she grew and basically it's grown with her it, it hasn't gotten bigger you know like it's an infection or gbd or whatever it's just this bubble i, I need to go take a picture i will in a minute but it's this bubble at the end of the tail that just gets bigger with her but i'm thinking if this is the seahorse that impregnates my male, um, well, first of all, I'm worried about her. Sorry, I'm rambling. But first of all, I'm worried about her. What do you think about that? And I'll go get a picture for you. But also, fry of a pair that has a defect. Thoughts? That's my question. First one. So I probably wouldn't be that worried about it, provided that, you know, she's, she's swimming and she's acting like a happy, healthy seahorse. Um, I have actually seen something very close to what you're talking about um, in a few seahorses before. So I feel like I know what you're talking about. It's almost like a, um, almost like a, I don't know, scar tissue that skin grows over and it, it sort of, uh, it scales up with the seahorse and it's almost like a, I don't know, like a, a strange little sort of, you know, bump on, on the seahorse's tail. Like it's, and it's sort of, it's sort of, you know, it's just got normal skin on it. It's the same color as the rest of the seahorse. It's not like a discolored white sort of uh, you know pimple looking thing. It's it's like a I've almost seen, like a bony I've growth. Seen that yeah, I've seen that happen too. Mm -hmm. With uh, okay, wait, wait. You guys talk. I'm going to get a picture real quick, and then I'll ask my second question. Talk away. And I just noted Katie's thing about seahorse personalities. Yeah, my seahorses have some great personalities. So. We'll talk. We'll talk about, yeah. You know, as you watch, as you watch the show, I talk about my seahorses. I'll probably talk about them a little later when she's showing the video. <laughs> Do you talk about your seahorses? I, I've got some horses with some character. I have one that's handicapped, actually. That that is actually a pretty cool seahorse. He's my oldest horse, and he's got a lot of personality, but he has trouble swimming. <laughs> I don't know if Kelly is actually here or not, but the, mm -hmm. the second part of her question was, should she be worried about the genetic component of it, like breeding that female yeah, with the male yeah. if it's got like that sort of oddity or deformity? Um, I wouldn't be too stressed about it. Like as long as it's not a deformity that is mm -hmm. basically like, you know, inhibiting or, or sort of affecting the quality of life of the seahorse, I wouldn't stress yeah. about it too much. Um, what seems like they have so many fry too, probably not a very big percentage of them would even have that same problem, do you think? Yeah. And the fortunate thing about seahorses, is like it, it's, it's a bit of a twisted way of looking at it, but the fortunate thing about seahorses is that because traditionally they don't have a great survival rate, if there are any seahorses that have a some sort of a deformity or some sort of a, a quirk that mm -hmm. that is really not favorable to the seahorse like say if they had a a, a a snout that was bent out at a 45 or 90 degree angle like a really deformed Poor snout thing. that basically meant that they couldn't eat properly they would starve and die 
like yeah. you're probably not going to raise that seahorse to completion, mm -hmm. um, which means that, you know, yeah. a deformity like that would affect the quality of life of the seahorse dramatically. Yeah. And they would basically, survive anyway, so it's kind of a moot point in that case. Exactly. Whereas I, I was just saying, Kelly, the, uh, the genetic component of it shouldn't be too much of a worry as long as it's not affecting the seahorse's quality of life and its its ability to you know live its life, um, okay, well, you're, or you're you know, breed or anything like that. Well, I keep thinking the male's pregnant and he's never pregnant, and I never see eggs. So, mate, I'm just gonna show you the pictures and let you tell me what up. Hang on, here we go. One second. Okay, so here is. Sorry, takes me a minute, guys. Apologies. Okay, so here is not that one. That one, yeah, okay. So here is the seahorse on. I will just let you guys know that is Heather's invention of the clear shower curtains that they freaking love. They love them. They, like, hang, and so they can be up high near the water flow. Um, but if you see at the end of the tail, can you guys see my pointer when I do this or no? Yes, yes, okay. we can. Yeah. And then I get, I get, whoop, well, not that picture. Sorry. Whoops. <laughs> okay. So now you see Sean. Um, oh, yeah. Look so, at. but this, it looks, I mean, like I would, when I got the seahorse, I was worried because it had this little white ball at the end of its tail, but it's not gotten bigger than she's gotten bigger, if that makes sense. So there's another one at an mm -hmm. at a upward angle. And then I turned it off. She's happy as can be. I mean, she's fine. And uh, guys, my seahorse is the color of the rock. I, it, it, she's not unhappy. She's fine. Uh, but anyways, so she's happy. She thought I was feeding her. So she's like, what the hell? Why are you sticking she's the camera cute. in my face? Of food? But then here's the best one, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's a really good picture. So, yeah, so look, I wouldn't be that worried about it because it, it is a bit of an off color to the rest of the seahorse, but... Yeah. It's there's there's no exposed you know flesh there or anything like that. There's no mm -hmm. openings or wounds for bacteria to affect. Um, it just looks like I don't know, like sort of uh, scar. I, I think it would probably be a combination of scar tissue and um, and skin regrowing over it. Um, because of course I was so, initially worried about it being uh, what's it called? Not white tip, uh, white tail. What's the word? Cheryl, Holly, somebody. Tail rock. Tail rock. Tail yeah, rock. but it's not at all done that. As we can see, she has a very long, fine tail. Yeah. So go ahead, Chris. I'm sorry, I interrupted. Yeah, as long as there's no signs of bacterial infection and it's not sort of inhibiting the way that she sort of, uh, you know, goes about her day to day life. I mean, it's it's probably not ideal, but um, you know, if anything, maybe the little bump might even give her a bit more sort of grip. <laughs> Um, yeah. when she's sort of uh, itching onto things. She doesn't act like it's painful, as you can see in this picture. As long as she yeah. doesn't get yeah. it stuck in a crack somewhere. <laughs> yeah, that's, well, her tail's bigger than that. But but I yeah. just, it, in this picture, I'm just noticing it kind of, I just over worry you guys, but it does kind of look like it was kind of not growing up, but, and it hasn't, it hasn't changed. It's gotten bigger with her, but she looked mm -hmm. like that, just a smaller bubble, smaller seahorse when I got her, but so you don't think it's not genetic. It's not something I should worry about breeding. I don't think so. It's probably some injury that, that she had when she was a very young seahorse and uh, it, it's healed over, it hasn't healed over perfectly as you can see, but it, it's not sort of inhibiting the way that she lives and um, it's not really, you know, hurting her. It's kind of like if, um, you know, I were to burn my arm or something and, you know, you would have scar tissue there and, and whatnot, but it would heal to a point and it might look a little bit different, but it wouldn't hopefully affect the day-to-day -day life. Well, and Cheryl, Cheryl had already made sure that I, you know, wasn't overly worried and I've had these seahorses for over a year. So, I mean, obviously it's okay. I just wondered about the genetic stuff, but I think you're right. I agree. And, uh, Oh, I missed all these questions, but <clears throat> go ahead. Oh, I thought Cheryl was going to say something. She was yawning. My bad. Well, no. Okay. Second question. Kelly, the thing yes, is, I have an eye appointment tomorrow after I, oh, I no worries. had major eye issues and had surgery on my eye, and I'm definitely get, getting sleepy right now. 
if you have to go, Cheryl, we just appreciate you coming and sharing all your knowledge. Go anytime you have to, but we appreciate you coming. Well, good luck with your appointment tomorrow, tomorrow. morning at 9 a.m. Well, I'll, I'll check in with you. But I'm always good to say, Cheryl. Yes. Thank you. And uh, okay, so second question was I need some clarification, and I wish Cheryl was able to stay for this part if you are. But when the seahorse, I'm not going to reenact it because that will be a meme forevermore. But when the seahorse uh, does the coughing, and you know what I'm talking about, not when they're eating, when they just go, and it's now I am reenacting it. Sorry. But the seahorse's snout's here. And they usually just swim around with their snout, right? And then they've got the little trigger. I'm not going to do a very good job of this, but I can find my way. But, you know, when they do this and the trigger snaps and they're not eating, they're just doing it, they're coughing. And that, to me, in my previous stint with keeping seahorses, ended up being that they had ciliates in the gills or something where they had needed, they needed help. So if I saw a seahorse doing that, this is a different tank, but it's a female in a different tank and she keeps coughing. I don't see the other ones coughing, but I've done massive water changes just in case she's still eating, right? She's still, everything's fine. But in my past seahorses, I literally lost a reed eye because she started coughing. I didn't know what it was. I didn't treat it soon enough. And then I lost her. So do you see seahorses cough? I say cough. And if you don't have seahorses, you're like, seahorses don't cough. They cough. Yep. Sally's yep. nodding. She knows. Mine do. A normal thing, like just if they're irritated, they got something stuck in their throat or literally coughing, or is that typically a sign that there's a problem? I, I wouldn't be too worried about it. It was just like a one-off because I've seen seahorses yawn. And that, mm -hmm. that's quite a funny sort of thing. It made me yawn as well when I realized what they were doing. Um, yeah. But I've, I've also seen seahorses kind of cough, like you're saying, and I've also seen them sneeze. And and if if it's a protracted thing, like if, if it's an ongoing thing and you see them and it's it's observable behaviour that they're doing again and again, that's when I would start to worry. Um, you know, maybe look at doing a possibly a, a, a freshwater dip or a formal and treatment or something. Um, maybe look at a few of your different options and just see if any of them observe the other seahorses in the tank and see if they're inhibiting exhibiting the same sort of um symptoms um right and, and i can say the other seahorses are not and um like i said i guess uh, and uh seahorse corner said could it be a mechanical obstruction might have sucked up sand with food and clear that out i don't have sand mm -hmm. in the tank there's no sand in any of my tanks right now so uh, good suggestion and i agree i think chris just gave perfect advice. Again, in Seahorse Sources group in the file section, there is how to do a freshwater dip. But I'm going to be like my hobby is self here and say, I hate giving freshwater dips. I know they don't hurt them. You can, Chris, you can tell me till I'm blue in the face. It doesn't hurt them. It's just a tool to determine what's going on and it does clear them out. But if they do freak out, then number one, you know, there's something wrong. And number two, it's just awful to watch. I did one. Oh, on a seahorse that had some major issues and it was terrible. I literally had to call Dan on FaceTime and be like, no, it can't be right. He's been he flipped in and he's like, I, I did mine when they were younger, when I moved the two um, that I had raised into the display tank when they, they were smaller. I'm about a hundred percent sure I have ciliates in the display tank. Right. But they were more irritating to the smaller seahorses than they were to the big seahorses. So right. I did give them a freshwater dip. And yeah, right about the eight minute mark, they went nuts and, you know, the little white came out. And I haven't treated them since because honestly, I can't treat the tank because right. of the other tank mates. So oh. I'm sure they have them. It's a party tonight. You're saying peroxide, you know, I do add a little bit of peroxide, you know, twice a day to the tank and leave it at that. But they're still eating and doing their thing, you know, but now and then I'll see somebody, you know. Well, no, or, and that, no, thank yeah. you so much for saying that, Holly, because and now welcome, Dan. It's a party tonight. 
Chris and Dan all in hey, one night. Holy poop. I wish I had, I had advertised. But I was going to say, that's a good point. And that's, I guess, my final question for my tank issues is when you see something like the tail bubble, Dan, if you didn't see it, I can show it again. Did you see it? No. Okay, I'm going to show it in a second. When you see something like the end of the tail bubble or you see something like coughing, yawning, hacking, but the seahorse is still eating, swimming, and acting normal, the real bottom line question I think others would like to know too is, when do you determine it's time to do something? But let me show him real quick again. Um, the uh, tail. Yeah. And then we can uh, discuss what I just asked. But Speaking of which, I'm going to run and add my peroxide and I'll be right back. <laughs> okay. All right. So Dan, my seahorse, uh, not from you, of course, but my seahorse uh, that I got. Um, sorry, Chris, that I'm repeating this again, but I just wanted to show okay. it you. Okay, so here it is, Dan. So this seahorse came with a small white bubble at the very tip of its tail. I showed Cheryl immediately. I may have even showed you. It's been a while. But I showed them, and they said, well, you know, maybe call the person you got it from. And I did, and they had no idea. And so Cheryl kind of advised me, and I think you too, just see what happens, kind of, you know. And this seahorse I've had over a year now, it the bubble grows with her as if it's part of her it doesn't seem like gbd to me oh shoot hang on sorry here we go um it doesn't seem like gbd to me but i am open the seahorse is fine she's the color of my rock she doesn't look pretty but and plus i didn't adjust the lighting to take a good picture which we just discussed but see the bubble and then uh it's not a bubble it's it's the end of her damn tail but she's fine she hitches fine no pain uh, where's the best? Is that the best picture? I think that's the best picture. Hang on. Yeah, no, that was the best. So see it? it, it but I mean, is it, it looks like is, it. is it hard yes. or is it fluid filled? I haven't touched it. Should I touch it? Yeah, we want to know if it's fluid filled or if it's like a granulo granuloma. Okay, I'll do it in a minute. Nobody ever asked me that. I will, I will go do that in a minute. And then, um, so you know that. And when I go touch it, I'll tell you. Um, but as I said, it's grown with her. She still eats. No problems with her. Then in another tank, sorry, let me cancel that. Um, then in another tank, I have a seahorse that's doing the stupid coughing crap. And you've helped me before with a red eye. You were the one that tried to help me save my female red eye, who I ended up losing because she started doing this coughing thing when they're not eating. I know that wasn't a good representation, uh, but when they their trigger comes down and they look like they're coughing, literally. And it looks like they're choking and seahorse corner said maybe it's sand being cleared, but no, I don't have sand. And she just keeps coughing. I've done major water changes. She still eats fine. She still swims fine. She's still flirting with the boys. But at what point do you say, okay, I might have a ciliate problem. I need to do something. Did you do a freshwater dip? Oh, <laughs> that's exactly what Chris said. I don't like freshwater dips, <laughs> but okay. then, then a formalin bath. No, I'll do the freshwater dip. It's better. It's a better diagnostic tool. You're right. I know. Well, and actually, can since you're here, can you tell us what that is? What what when we say freshwater dip, someone new like Katie is like, what? Well, a freshwater dip is where you place them in water for a period of time to see what the reaction is. And it acts as a diagnostic tool and it acts as a therapeutic tool. Um, from a diagnostic standpoint, if they react to the freshwater dip, we can assume they have some parasitic load. And um it also helps kill that parasitic load um so normally when we do a fresh normally i advocate doing a minimum of eight minutes and if during the eight minutes they react then i continue it on for 11 to 12 minutes to make sure that uh it really does a good job of cleaning them up um if they do not react to the dip at all i'll pull them after eight minutes it's counterintuitive because they'll start thrashing about if they have a parasitic load. And most people, the reaction is to immediately pull them out when in reality, the fresh water is doing its job and you want to let it do its job and kill as many of the little buggers as you can. Um, some people actually advocate a longer dip. Uh, Kelly Jalecki, for example, the puffer queen used to advocate longer. Um, I've had people leave them in longer and not have a problem, but I... Generally, after 11 to 12 minutes, I pull them. 
And if necessary, if I feel like they need it, then I'll follow that up with a form. Normally, I, I follow it with a formal immersion bath anyway. But if I still feel that they have a heavy load, I'll do a short-term formal uh, dip, which is a 45-minute dip at a higher concentration. So uh, I, I, oh, sorry. I'm go so ahead. sorry. Okay, I was just going to say, I'm going to go touch a tail real quick to find out about this bubble. Take a look, too, uh, is if you can see through the, the bubble. Oh, I know you can't do that, it, but I will go look and make sure. And okay. Holly's question having to do with that is, if you think that your seahorse has ciliates in their gills or wherever, you do a freshwater dip, they do thrash, so there's a problem, and you know there's ciliates in the tank, and there are. There are always ciliates in the tank. You just manage them. But do you, Holly asked what you asked earlier, and I'm going to go touch a tail. I'll be right back. Okay. Uh, Holly, you're Holly. muted. She's not muted. Um, shit. Can't hear you. Maybe she muted herself. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. So, uh, so the questions are concerning if you have a community tank where you have other fish and the seahorses and you know you have ciliates, how can you successfully treat the seahorses? Can you do a freshwater dip like say once every couple weeks or every month or because you're not able to treat the other things in the tank. So they'll just get the ciliates back. So is there a way to manage or help with that? There is. Um, number one, um, the freshwater dip, you can dip all the animals. Um, I don't like doing freshwater dips more than any more than once a week. Okay. Um, I've, I've seen some fungal issues and problems come up doing too many freshwater dips too close together. What okay. I prefer to do is to alternate between a freshwater dip and a short-term formalin dip. Okay. Um, and how do you do the fish? Are the fish the same as the seahorses as far as time and so on? Or I... I, I haven't had to dip fish, and I won't profess to be a super knowledgeable in that area. My understanding is that most people dip regular gilled fish at a much shorter time frame, typically about four minutes. Um, and before I would tell you to do it any longer than that, I'd want to contact somebody that's more knowledgeable with regular fish than me. Mm -hmm. gotcha. um, as but far it as the tank, done, huh? yeah, is, how many gallons is a tank? 55 and then about a 20 gallon sump. Okay. Do you uh, have peroxide on hand? I do. I dose it with peroxide twice a day, actually. How much? And I, uh, 10 milliliters. Of what percentage of peroxide? Uh, I believe it's 3%. It's just the kind you get the drugstore over the, over the counter. So you're dosing roughly uh three percent so that would be 33 times 10 330 and so you're doing just a little over one part per million and you're doing it twice a day i do it twice a day yeah usually in the morning and then in the afternoon okay um and that hasn't made any impact it does actually when i started doing that that I did no, uh, notice less scratch. Like they won't scratch now. I don't see the scratching, but I'm sure there's still ciliates. I keep the salinity low. At that won't make a difference. Low. I the, keep the, the Holly. Mm -hmm. The the ciliates that we're most concerned about can survive hyposalinity. Oh wow! So, you know, when you start looking at your anema type ciliates, they can easily withstand low salinity. So. It, I don't see that as a great, it, there's some, some protozoans that that will have an impact on, but mm -hmm. for what I'm most concerned about, it's not going to be a big difference. So don't bust your tail on that. Um, yeah. Cause I'm sure they've had ciliates. I mean, for years, but I, I mean, I just know for sure they, they've got to be in there. You know, I see the signs of it, but it doesn't, it doesn't seem to be really affecting them that much. 
Now I did a fresh water dip on the young ones when I put them in the display tank after yep. they were in there about a week. They were having more problems with the ciliates than the bigger seahorses were. So I took them out and gave them a fresh water dip. And right about the eight seconds when I was getting ready to pull them, that's when the thrashing started. So I left them in the full 12 minutes and put them, put them back. And of course, they're grown up now. They're as big as the other seahorses. And I haven't dipped anyone since. And okay. I've been using the peroxide. So I imagine they have them, but it's probably not severe. So I don't um, know that it's worth treating, that they might get them again if I put them back in the tank, or should I treat them now and then? Do you have a protein skimmer on the tank? Yeah. Uh, what type? It's a Simplicity. It's huge. Okay. It's Is it pulling a lot of skimmate? Yeah. Huh? Is it pulling a lot of skimmate? Yeah. Not a whole lot because it's so big. I only have to empty it like every morning. It has a little bit. It bubbles up, but it's the skimmer's so big that it doesn't fill the cup. Okay. Um, are you getting? Are you doing it on the wet side or the dry side? I uh, I would say kind of in between. Run it on the wet side. So where it gets more water in the cup, then. No, like yep. yeah. Are you running charcoal on the system? Yeah. Okay. I have the char, the aqua, aqua char. char. Aqua okay. char. How long have you been running the aqua char? About a year, I think. Yeah, but wait, wait. I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but remember, Holly, with aqua char, it stops working as carbon and starts working as biomedia. So you might need, remember, we talked about you hadn't oh, changed. Yeah, yeah, because I haven't changed it out. I haven't yeah. added it, added to it. Okay. What what fish do you have in there? I have one um, blue spotted watchman goby and the seahorses, two peppermint shrimp, and a handful of crabs. Okay. Any corals? No. Any plants? No. Okay. Live rock? No. Any sand? Hold it. Yes. And how big is the sump? The sump's about 20 gallons. How much food are you putting in there daily? Oh, I couldn't give you a weight. I don't use cubes. I, don't, I, don't, to feed. I, don't, I would I don't say mean... thumbnail size a few times a day, like the size okay. of my thumbnail for the four seahorses. Is there food left over? Not after I siphon it. <laughs> Okay. Sometimes so there is, sometimes they're, sometimes they don't finish it all. And sometimes they eat it all. Okay. Chris, I think we're in an episode of CSI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when's the, when's the last time you did a major water change? Two, I changed a hundred percent of the water other than the sump. What was it? Three weeks ago. That's when I pulled the live rock and switched okay. it to, um, Artificial. But you do, you do water changes every week, right? Yeah, I did a water change today. I change a third of the tank every week. Okay. I do I do a 20-gallon um, water change. So a third of the tank size, not the total water volume. With what you're doing with the peroxide, uh, I would think that you would start catching up based on the description of everything else. And mm -hmm. if you really want to um try to to really catch up the large water change is very very helpful the, doing the, the, essentially 100 mm -hmm. percent um but if you cut back on the feeding for a week feed them a little bit lighter and mm -hmm. continue with the peroxide mm -hmm. and you should be caught up on the ciliates i can't imagine that you wouldn't be i haven't seen any signs of them really lately honestly since i did that change out yeah i but i would I think that much attention honestly because i've had them for so long you know i'm i'm so used to them but i'll start watching and see but you know now that you bring it up 
Yeah, I haven't seen really anybody having any problems. You're catching up. You're catching up. But Dan, now, uh, I, I would recommend this. Once you think you are fully caught up, I would cut mm -hmm. back on the peroxide to once a day instead of twice. Mm -hmm. um, are you? Are you? I assume you're checking your parameters correctly. Yeah, I do that, but I don't check for peroxide in the water. No, 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 I, no. I but everything else. <laughs> that peroxide is probably gone within. 30 minutes to an hour. Okay. With yeah, that, with that yeah. Dose. Um, but what you particularly want to pay attention to is your nitrites. That's mm -hmm. always the first to go when you're dosing. And gotcha. I haven't had any of those. Good. Even since I changed out everything, everything's been at zero or the nitrates now are getting to where they're probably about two, the nitrates. My phosphates, I have a kit that tests at parts per billion, and it was down to like 0. 0.004. So yeah. there's not much of anything in there right now because it's been three weeks since I changed everything out. So, But that's when I added the K1 reactor to the sump. And How, how many gallons are in the sump? Live rock. How many gallons are in the sump? I believe it's 20. It might be 15 or between 15 and 20. I think it's a 30 gallon sump. But one thing I've noticed about the sump, because I've, I've measured how much water fits in it. It's never what they tell you. Right. No, there never is. 20. I believe what it actually holds what's in there is 20, possibly a bit less. Okay. Um, I, I still, if you, once you think you're caught up, I would drop the peroxide dosing down to once a day. All right. Just and keep an eye a, on them and see if they're yeah, showing you do that as a maintenance. You're doing slightly more than a part per million, but, um, mm -hmm. with the sump, it's not even, it's not even quite to 1.5. Uh, it, mm -hmm. that should not impact your biofilter. Um, mm -hmm. I just think you're overdoing it if you're caught up doing it twice a day. Gotcha. Yeah, thanks for the tip. I did. I was doing that based on on one of these shows. There was somebody on here. Was it Humblefish that was talking yeah. about how she peroxide dosed for ciliates? And, yeah. and that's why I started doing it. So it's been I've been doing that now for a couple of years. And I did like she did and gradually increased the dose over time. Well, Humblefish is another great, great, wait, great website for sure, <laughs> um, as we've been discussing. And yeah, no, Dan's going to talk about peroxide in depth in Ask Seahorse Part 3, which we haven't scheduled yet. But um, anyhow, did you have anything else about that, Dan? Just no, I, I think I'm going to start watching them closer to see if they're showing any signs still that they have any ciliates. And then, like mm -hmm. Dan said, if they're not, I can back off the peroxide. Yeah, I'd simplify it. But Dan, did you did you always? I mean, do you, if you if there was no problem, you still use peroxide, didn't you? No, not always. Um, yeah, I. In heavy heavy systems, I would, but like my broodstock systems that were lightly stocked, I didn't. You know, my juvenile tanks, I did because they were so heavily stocked and I had so much organic matter. Um, and I've actually done much, much, much higher dosing in the past when necessary. But as a maintenance, you know, one or two parts per million is usually not going to have any impact. When you start getting above 10 parts per million, you got to really watch your nitrites. And if you do multiple doses in succession right. you know like every day you'll you'll start seeing the your nitrites go up mess up your your nitrates. your nitrites will go first and then the ammonia will follow um yeah. and you know as a dip you know sometimes people do much higher dosing but we've never settled upon what the correct dosing is for seahorses as a dip instead of fresh water or formalin so <clears throat> that question i never I stopped doing the seahorses before I found the answer to that question. Uh, oh, Dan, I forgot to tell you. Do you think that helped with the ciliates, the removing the live rock? Is that somewhere that they hide or do anything? Well, with or your do your live rock could be 
uh, holding a certain amount of organic matter. Mm -hmm. um, and algae. And, yeah. and mm -hmm. the live rock would also impact what the peroxide is doing. Mm -hmm. So by removing that, you have less things for the peroxide to interact with if it is, in fact, holding organic matter. Um, mm -hmm. Which is going to be holding some organic matter. Just the bacteria alone is going to be some of the organic matter. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the biofilm and everything else. But mm -hmm. um, I just think by removing the, the rock, you've probably allowed the peroxide to do more of what it's supposed mm -hmm. to do. Makes mm -hmm. sense. And Dan, I just thought I'd let you know that Katie joined us tonight. She's in Florida. <laughs> and I already... Uh, signed you up i already said he'll help you oh my gosh you can make him get back into seahorses so just to let you know but uh real quick before we go to my seahorse tail ball and if there was more that i'm interrupting please interrupt me but that was interesting to me when holly said and i know it's very hard to say this is how much you feed a seahorse nobody's ever been able to say this is it but a thumbnail, which maybe my thumb's not as big or whatever, but mm -hmm. and I don't have nails today, but I feed a lot more than that every time I feed, and and I don't have that many leftovers. Chris, uh, Dan has. Well, all the, the things are thick too. The oh, okay. The, you got to remember they're in a pack, so it kind of depends. Like if I'm getting it from the edge, it's thinner. When I get to the middle of the pack, it's it can gotcha. be thicker. So yeah, it's hard to make. I don't measure it. Well, and Chris, you I probably could, Chris, you probably couldn't answer that anyways because you were feeding more than four, right? I mean, you never had just four that you were feeding. Yeah, I do. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I would just, I would just sort of wing it. I would just eyeball it and just try and feed an appropriate amount for any given tank. When you're going around and doing like a ridiculous number of tanks, you just sort of you get a good. Yep, yeah, that'll do. <laughs> Do, do different species and like even within the species, different seahorses eat different amounts? I mean, like you have. Yeah, definitely. Seahorses. Definitely. You, you're constantly you sort of um, feeding and then you go around, you feed everything. And then I would come back and do another loop around and just observe how much is eaten what. And uh, there were definitely some tanks that would have similar stocking levels to another tank, but either due to being a different species or even being the same species but just more voracious seahorses um maybe there was more involved in egg production or whatever they were just going through a lot more food or some were just a bit more fussy or just not hungry that day um yeah mine change and, uh, every day pretty much you gotta learn your seahorses some days, you gotta learn them. Some days they will eat less I'll, yeah I'll I, we, we used to I about how i attempt to feed new seahorses and you know, all the tips, like don't have your face right in there. Cause they're like, what the hell is this big face? I, then they don't want to eat, you know, and, and, and oh, putting mine them don't mind my face. Them. I'm always videoing them. They get uh, well. excited when they see the camera, they all come, they're all feed well, us. But I, no, 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 no. But I meant, I was talking about new seahorses. When I got the piebalds mm -hmm. from Dan, um, by the way, Stacy, uh, Stacey, that's the, or Katie, sorry, that's Dan that, that way that's Dan. But, um, so when I got the piebalds from Dan, I did a video showing, you know, these guys are brand new. I put them in the tank, temp it up, I made them show, showed all that. And then I was like, okay, so I'm going to try to feed them. And I just went through the tips. Like when you have brand new seahorses, you don't want your face up against the glass because watching them because they're already like fish in place, you know? And, uh, you know, just the way that I did it, put in this much, check after five, 10 minutes, see what's there, adjust accordingly. Chris, I see you do have to go soon. I'm sorry. Before you do go, the end of my question was, I went and touched the tail. She was not happy <laughs> about me touching the tail. <laughs> but I don't, I don't, I, I, as I've gotten more into seahorses, I'm very hands off now. My hands don't go in the tank, like hardly ever. So that may have been why. Just, I don't think I hurt her. She just didn't want me to touch her. Mm -hmm. So it's hard. It feels like a ball. You can't see through it. It's not spongy. It's not squishy. The granuloma. It's... So what's that? That's a growth. And most commonly when I see it on the tail and I've seen necropsies done, it comes back with acid fast bacteria. Um, Wait, you said bacteria? Acid fast bacteria. Which is not so dangerous? 
Well, acid bacteria would be mycobacteria, uh, nicardia, or something along those lines. Um, in, in slow growing cases, they can continue on and never, never amount to much of anything other than an unsightly growth. And as long as it's not tender and doesn't affect the animal, then fine. Um, in some cases, if it, you know, if a event comes to where the immune system changes and it takes off, then suddenly it can be a wipeout. So watch for it to grow. Pay attention to it. Like in that picture, she's using it to hitch. She, it right. isn't her. If, if you told me she got this today, you know, a couple of days ago, right. I would be concerned. But the fact that she's had it for this long, I'm going to tell you just to continue on. If you try to treat it, you, the odds are you'll go through a lot of, um, of antibiotics with minimal, to, if any, results. And if you do have results, they're going to be temporary. And my final question was that I asked Chris earlier and he answered well, but um, like uh, genetically, should I be worried about this being passed on? It's bacterial, so it's not going to be passed on. It's not. It's not a genetic thing, it, but okay. anybody in the tank should be suspect. And based upon that, I would not mix anybody in that tank with any other seahorses. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Well, she's there. She's in there with Aphrodite and Aphrodite hasn't had any problems. So what, what we did when we encountered that at one time, we had that a lot when I first started and we tried treating, we tried doing this, we tried doing that. And finally, what we resorted to was calling anybody that was symptomatic. And yeah. when we took that approach, we were able to eradicate it. You know, if it's actually mycobacteria and you have it tested, they'll tell you to basically wipe everything out. Um, but, you know, what we found was by calling the anybody that was symptomatic, we eliminated it and didn't have any further problems. Well, and I know that tail rot is it, like that's what I initially thought that it was some sort of tail rot, but that spreads quickly and and does, yeah, tail rots can present itself entirely differently with the discoloration, okay. and okay. often it'll start moving up the tail, uh, but normally you'll see the tail turn white, and yeah. as the as the tissue becomes necrotic. Just wanted to make sure, and Chris, I just wanted to give you ten seconds or however long you need. Uh, we love that you join and share your knowledge and I know you have to go. So was there anything else you wanted to chat about? Any questions I didn't answer that you wanted to answer or whatnot? No, that's cool. I was just coming in to just chat and just say how you guys are going and to say hello. Well, we miss you. I, I want to talk to you on the side. Not right now. I know you're working, but um, I want to talk to you on the side. Just kind of catch up because we miss you. We want you to come anytime you want. <laughs> but Good seeing yeah, you. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. Yeah. Likewise, Dan. Been too long. <laughs> yep. I know. We still need it. Guys, we need to get Katie. You might be the person, the link. Get all these guys back in because we miss them all so much with the Seahorse world. But um, let me see. What was the other question I was going to ask? Dang it. Holly left and now I've lost my question. Fantastic. Well, Seahorse, Corner, you... Seahorse Corner made the remark that uh, they feed one cube per pair of seahorses three times a day. And what I used to tell my customers was to feed between a half to a cube per pair three times a day. Seahorse Corner knows what's up. There you go. We need to get back, her back in here too. But um, there was not. Oh, so how about Dan and and I and Ray already covered in the very beginning. I just re-asked the questions because you're here now. But he already said this is too deep of a question to cover in one episode or you know one answer but katie wanted to know like if you here, just a synopsis if your seahorses have fry how difficult is it to keep the fry what how difficult is feeding what do you feed and what do you do if you don't want to or can't well the difficulty in keeping the fry, all you have to do is look around at how many people are successful raising fry. And, you know, you can define success in different ways. You know, some people are happy if they raise one or two. You know, for us, if anything less than 50% survival rate was a loss. So, you know, we were looking for much higher survival rates. And, you know, we, we considered ourselves doing okay when we got up to 90%. Um, some species are much more difficult. So, 
you know, with Erectus and our benthic species, we we expected to get at least 80% and ideally above 90%. Uh, when you get into reed eye and some of the more uh, difficult pelagic species, you know, anybody who's doing 50% is considered doing very, very well. Uh, so it really depends upon the species and the type of fry, but it's, it's for the average person starting off, it's not easy raising fry. Um, it's a great learning experience. Um, consistency, if you're successful, is difficult to maintain. Sure. Um, the hardest part is trying to get all the information down and understand exactly what's going on and get the live foods down. Um, oh, yeah. You know, if you can get the live foods figured out other than just, and when I say live foods, I mean understanding really what you're doing with them, um, not just hatching and feeding. It's a matter of understanding the nutritional aspects, understanding how to keep the bacteria counts down low while doing it and what have you. Um, what I will say is that it's a great learning experience and the person's appreciation for a good breeder goes up immensely after they've tried to do it themselves. And we will, you will talk about that in depth when we are, are able to schedule as Seahorse Source Part 3. Those are some of the questions that we go into, into depth in. And Chris, I just asked you in the chat, but what was the most difficult species species, blah, 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 species you had raised, you've tried, done? Okay, I'm going to shut up. Species. Difficult. Which one? <laughs> yeah, it, it's probably... There's quite a few of them that are quite difficult. I remember having a really, really rough time with red eye um, mm -hmm. at, at the start, um, and I asked Dan and, and some others for some help. Um, and in the end, we we did have some success with them. Uh, like Dan said, like you you set your expectations for different species and different survival rates accordingly. And uh, red eye always had a much lower survival rate than many of the other species that we did. Um, I, I guess I would sort of gauge sort of success with a species as to how many you're actually producing rather than focusing too much on um, like survival rates. Survival rates are definitely a portion of it, but if you're producing several hundred or several thousand seahorses, then you're doing well regardless of what the, um, the survival rate is per batch. And is um, that because you have a, a correctly and welly, welly, welly's not a word, uh, a, a, a well-prepared pair? Is that why you would have more versus the range? Uh, Sorry. Usually I, I wouldn't actually say we were sort of doing pairs. We just sort of more had groups, like breeding groups. Um, I, I'd never been sort of keeping individual pairs and okay. sort of track how they sort of breed. It was more of a stick a whole bunch of seahorses in together and a bit of a free-for-all, um, whoever's got available when you've eggs got and pouches or whatever. Why not? Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, but I, I would say probably the hardest um, or most difficult uh, breeding for us would have been the uh, the Breviceps and the Tuberculatus, the dwarf seahorses. Um, we didn't end up having as much success success with those because we weren't properly set up for them um, and and whatnot in the end. So uh, tried and tried and didn't have that much success with those compared to the red eye. I had a lot of trouble with the red eye, but in the end we ended up having success with them, uh, getting quite a few of them out. But um, yeah. I, I I personally found H engines to be the most difficult. They were much harder mm. than red eye. Cheryl talked about Yeah, Cheryl was mentioning them earlier, pain in the butt. <laughs> you guys have done stuff we can't, but again, for anybody new, you can do it with Erectus for quite much more easily, in my opinion. I've had brand new people, newbies, that have never had a tank before, get a pair of Erectus, have babies, call me up, and go over it with them Race on the them. phone, and mm -hmm. they succeeded in raising them. Actually, you're talking about me. Yeah. I was a brand new newbie. <laughs> you helped me do it. So, absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's it. Shyla, uh, we hope you feel better. Hate to hear you have COVID. That's terrible. But no, absolutely. So, um, Dan or, or Chris, anything else you guys want to answer, discuss, chat about? Again, we'll discuss the, the fry topic in depth 
when we do Ask the Horse Source Part 3. But I do want to make sure it's getting late. My tongue's getting twisted. And I want to make sure that we do show Holly's videos that she shared with me. The videos she shared, Dan and Chris, are basically showing that seahorses will look different regardless of changing color in different lighting. Like, depending on your lighting, the seahorses look different. Do you guys agree? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, definitely. All right. So I'm just going to show her pretty videos. And then we'll, we'll be done. I was I'm just going to go. But um, it was really, really good seeing you all. And uh, yeah. I hope everyone's going well. And we'll have to catch up again soon. Virtual yeah, hug. Have a great one, Chris. Welcome. Virtual hug. See and I will actually get with you on the side. Night, Chris. All right. Real quick. All right, and then and if care. you guys have any other questions for Dan, put them up. We'll, of course, have more questions for I'll him. I'll be right back. Three. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. let's do the videos real quick just to show. And, Miss uh, Holly, you'll have to tell us what we're looking at here. Let's see. We'll see which one you're going to put on. I might not know what we're looking at. <laughs> I know, right? Okay, well, <laughs> this is definitely not your picture. This is what my significant other has done with my old reef tank. I was going to say there's plants. <laughs> That's not it either. Okay. All right. Here we go. That's not it either. Here Hang on. Go. I'm having troubles. Hang on. Let me let me stop this. So you don't see my... You're going to have to find it. And one second. Here we go. Okay. Kelly do the burn. Okay. And get to the first one. All right. I think this is the first one. I may have some mixed up with just lighting versus something else but you can tell me yeah i'd have to see yeah. what it is i know sorry <laughs> trying to do five things so sorry the best one's probably the big one of scrappy do where it's kind of a here we go up. well if i don't have it we'll we'll watch it again but what is this one i don't know why yeah i don't think that's one of them really Okay, Scrappy Doo trying to court. Or you know what? If I've screwed this up, you could share them. Oh, you can kind of see though in this. Okay, so see how she was swimming and she was yellow. See how their colors are kind of changing? Yeah, look at her yellow yeah, head. Right. Yeah, that's the lighting changing because I have it set on the cloudy day setting. So it rotates between a bluer light and the yellow light yeah. so you can see they're they look different to our eyes depending on the lighting they're under yeah but look at how yeah, beautiful the, she looks i'm gonna stop sharing and try to find what i'm actually trying to share here yeah Sorry. the best one you'll find is the big one of scrap do yeah where you see just him and he's on a um coral okay here we go i think i got Let's it say, Crappy do. All right, here we go. And let me that's pause probably this. the best one. Okay, let me start it over. Sorry. My computer's literally flashing at me saying, stop it. All right. <laughs> but it, I, I mean, you sent me the videos. We got to show it. So. <laughs> All right. This one. Okay. Yeah. That's probably the best because you can see him. See how. Oh, my gosh. He did so much. Yeah. And yeah, that's not him changing. That's the lighting changing. Yep. Well, that's why I felt, so oh my gosh, look how yellow I think either. for seahorse keepers that want their seahorses to look more yellow or y y put them under a yellow tinted light, a yellower light. Because the blue, one. yeah, the blue tends to dull them. Let's see what else we got here in Holly's fortune. Yeah, so the, you can see this was back when I had the live rock. This one, see all the algae. Mm -hmm. But look at it, look at the color change. But look at the color, yeah. That's crazy. And and that's I tell everybody all the time. I go look at my seahorses, and I have no 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 sand, no ornaments really. Cut mm -hmm. one or two yellow ones. And then rock. And so they, as you saw earlier. But you can all, see my rock is really ugly, but right. the seahorses don't choose to match the rock, really. They choose to match where they like to hang out. Yeah. So 
they're more apt, I've noticed, to match. There's those shower curtain rings again, huh? <laughs> we were talking Heather. about. Yeah. But no, no, I get your point. And, and that's what tells me that I need to put more colorful ornaments in there for them that they might like, you know, that they might enjoy mm -hmm. and turn that color. Because now in my that case, yellow I have, dish I have in there, when I put that yellow feeding dish in, the gold colored one, mm -hmm. they all wanted to match that dish. They oh, really nice. liked it. They flocked to it when it was new. They knew what it was. They're like, oh, this is a dish. So they really went for it. And the females especially just fell in love with that dish and got all bright yellow to match it. Well, you guys, but I apologize. Uh, real quick, I will just say uh, my computer is going bonkers. And so I'm going to stop uh -oh. sharing. But check out Holly's page on Facebook to see mm -hmm. more of her seahorses changing color and her point is valid and you just saw it. Um, but no, I get it. So I'm going to take your advice and I'm going to add some more ornaments that are colored to my tank and see if it makes a difference. Also mm -hmm. in the pictures I was showing earlier where the, I was showing the white ball on her tail. I didn't adjust the lighting. So that's what my pictures look like. If I don't turn the blue off, it looks blue. Mm -hmm. She looks white. It, it's drab. They definitely look better you know, when the blue lights are off, I'll do that. Yes. Sometimes I take pictures of them with the blue lights too, you know, just cause a it's a pain the butt to mess with the lighting. But, um, a quick I've tip noticed if I can. when I have no light at all, like in the grow out tank, I don't use a light most of the day at all. They're just in the ambient daylight from the big picture windows and the skylights and they tend to get really bright without i bet that's dan's tip dan go ahead now my tip is is that oh. if you have a problem with a seahorse and you're taking a picture to show people to help you figure out what's going on turn the blue lights off yes, yes. absolutely ray said that too <laughs> ray said that too absolutely because yeah. it's so hard it's to see horrible anything. for pictures yeah it is which and in my case as i said the blues were still on so that's mm -hmm. why the seahorse didn't look beautifully colored, but you could still see a good picture because literally my blues are at 10%. I mean, they're, they're way low anyways. The pictures aren't mm -hmm. fabulous. I should have turned it completely off, as Dan said, but mm -hmm. um, I turned up the whites and turned down the blues just because I don't like messing with the uh, light and making it do different things. But Yeah, the absolutely. programming thing is a pain. That one, the way I do the... Um, the cloudy day thing is just a button I push and it goes into that program. So I like using that because I don't have to program anything, but it overrides whatever program it's in. So I have to turn, remember to turn it off so right. that light will shut down at night and so on. Do you know what? I stopped using all the programming crap. I don't, I, I don't like it. I, yeah. I, when I had the macros, and I had to care for the macros. If you have macros or coral mm -hmm. or whatever, you've got to have light mm -hmm. at certain times of the day. You've got to make sure they have enough, et cetera. But now that I just have seahorses, mm -hmm. I don't like that. I'd rather turn it on when I get up. Yeah, I'd rather it. have it like the other seahorses have a shop light above them. Yeah. And I'd, I'd rather have them, you know, under just normal light in the display mm -hmm. tank, but that's the light that I have, you know, that came with the tank. So it's another project, you know, to change, change it out. Like I said, we're going to get rid of the hood and, and put brackets for light and all that. So that's coming, but not yet. <laughs> Meanwhile, it's easier to just use what I got. Yep. Okay, guys. Yeah. I was going to, Dan just said, got to go shortly. And I'm going to say, my wine glass is empty. So sad <laughs> of me. But anyhow, <laughs> we're going to go ahead. We're, yeah, it, it, it's that time. We we love when Chris and Dan and you guys folks, you guys join, but, um, you know, the wine's going. So we're going to have to continue this next week. Don't forget, you can ask any questions in the video below afterwards. We'll answer them next week. I always check comments. Don't forget to go join Seahorse Sources group and subscribe to this channel, of course. And um, I'm gonna, as soon as we stop being live, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get Dan on the 
on the uh, promise to be here for Ask Sea Horse Horse Part 3. So all your questions about fry and peroxide and probiotics will be answered soon. But for tonight, you guys, thank you so much for everybody that came. Thank you for everybody who watches later.